1 Kings 17 this morning, starting at verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself in the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. And he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she um, and as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of the bread in your hand. And, as she, and she said, As the Lord your God gives lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Thank you, Laura. Let's bow our heads in prayer, everybody. Father, thank you for your word this morning, which guides us through life. We thank you that your word brings life to us. It's a light to our feet so that we can see where we're going. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, ignite within us, uh, Lord, a desire to see your word broken down so that we may uh, see breakthrough in our own lives. Um, just with every head bowed and every eye closed before we go into the Word, if there are any of you that really desire to see breakthrough in a specific area before we even get started in the Word today, can I just get you to just lift your hands to Him and surrender and surrender that breakthrough to Him. Father, right now, for these of us who have our hands lifted, Lord, we stand in agreement with these ones who are surrendering their situations to you, much like this widow, Lord God, where she was prompted to surrender her situation where you brought breakthrough. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that the Lord of the breakthrough would show up and show himself strong in this place. We thank you, Lord, that in faith you are igniting Lord God, a desire to see you break through. And right now, I just prophesy breakthrough in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. amen. Can we give them praise in advance? All right, as you take your seat, say hi to three people around you. Introduce yourself. If you're here for the first time, my name is Nelly. Uh, I'm the senior pastor here. It's so good to have you here with us this morning. Can we give it up for those who are here for the first time? Welcome. Welcome. Um, yeah, don't forget, as um, was, was talked about in that video, uh, we have family feed happening right after this, okay? So come, let, let's eat together, uh, let's share a meal together, so uh, right after this, okay, we're going to uh, pack these chairs away, we're going to put tables out, and we're going to eat together as a family. Okay, turn to the three people you didn't come with and tell them, your family. So, so come through, come through. Don't, as we used to say in, in Singapore, don't shy la. All right, okay. Uh, so we're in the series called The Generosity Effect. And uh, this is our final session going through uh, the scriptures, just looking at examples of generosity. And the title of my message today, as we're looking at that passage from 1 Kings, is which three words, which three words. And we're looking at the source of generosity. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at Christ's design for generosity. Uh, we don't muster generosity in, our, in and of ourselves, but uh, gospel-centered generosity comes from us experiencing the gospel in our own lives and letting the gospel overflow in our generosity. And so the question we asked right at the start was, does God have the priority in your finances and in your resources? Because if He does, then we can expect Him to move mightily uh, in the way that He uh, executes our, our, uh, his lordship or his rulership in our lives. 
Last week, uh, I talked about the rich young ruler. You, you'll remember that? And I talked about his encounter with Jesus. And in that encounter, he talked to Jesus and he approached him. And the thing that he said to him was, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response was to answer his question by asking another question. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. And so when we come to God, uh, we, ex we expect that he is a good God. How many of you believe that today, that he is good? Like we used to say in the old church, right? God is good. Oh, there we go. Okay, these are the, these are the oh, I've got to finish it off now. And all the time, <laughs> right? So, so, see, these are the people that have been around church for less than six, uh, more than six months. So, uh, anyway, um, the Greek word that is used for good is the word agathon or agathos in the Greek. And uh, it means intrinsically good. So that goodness flows from the inside out. And that's where generosity comes from, right? It's not trying to be good or do good stuff. Or say if you're an amazing rugby or rugby league player and you score a ton of tries. And, and they say, wow, he's good at that sport. How many of you know that's a different kind of good to agathos? Well, agathos is essentially saying it's a goodness from the inside out. It's not just a perceived goodness or a skill on the outside, but it's a transformation that happens from the inside out. So when he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. He's not talking about, wow, you're good at miracles. Oh, you're good at raising people from the dead. You're good at talking. No, he's saying, no, you are the source of goodness. And out of that source comes the overflow of generosity. And the question we asked at the close of last week was, are you willing to let God and His goodness have full control of your finances? It's not that He is a taskmaster, but that He knows what's good for you. Right? How many of you know that God has a good plan for your life? It's good for you. Some of you might have it on your refrigerator, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, right? For I know the plans I have for you, ha. plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and a future, plans not to harm you. Like these are the plans that God has for you. God's got some good plans for your life. Well, why, why is life not happening the way I want it to? See, this is our approach. He, he's not a genie, he's Lord. And unless we trust in the goodness of the Lord, fully in His Lordship, that He rules and reigns in every area of our lives, we will not see Him as God. So are we willing to trust Him? So that's where we're going to go today in closing the series out in 1 Kings chapter 17. It says, then the word of the Lord, everybody say Lord. Lord meaning boss, meaning ruler, meaning the one who calls the shots in your life. Then the word of the Lord came to him, arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. So Zarephath is a small town in the region of Sidon and dwell there. Stay there. Plan on being there for a while. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Now, at the top of the passage that Laura read, there was a bunch of ravens, right, that were feeding Elijah. So this is important to remember. So when I talk about which three words, what I'm going to highlight is five sets of three words. And I believe that one or maybe two, maybe the whole lot of the sets of three words will speak to where we are today. So the first set of three words based off of this part of the passage are these three words. Arise. Everybody say arise. arise. Go. Everybody say go. Behold. And behold. Everybody say behold. behold. Okay, here's the thing. All right? There is no going without beholding. There is no arising without beholding. Now, I, I um, had the opportunity about uh, nine years ago.
have authority. Sometimes we still think we have position. Any position or any authority that we have comes from him being in us. And it's out of this worship, some doubting, but still showing up. You know, it's a good thing that even in your doubts, you still show up to the mountain. Right? There's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief doesn't even show up to the mountain. Unbelief is cynical towards those who are going to the mountain. If you're going to the mountain, psh, idiot. Why are you going to the mountain for? Crazy. Doubt goes, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm just going to show up. I just know that you've got something for me. And so I'm glad you've shown up. Turn to somebody, encourage them this morning. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. Right? Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Okay? So they have beheld and they have arisen to go to the mountain. And he says to them, what? Go, therefore go, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, everybody say behold. I am with you always. This is the most important part of the commission. It's not the stuff you need to do, but the fact that you should behold the one who is with you at all times. If you walk around through life, it's easy right now because you've got a big brown Samoan guy talking to you about Jesus to remember Jesus, right, in this moment. But tomorrow, how many of you know, life happens on Monday and there's so many distractions around you that will cause you not to behold and be aware that he is with you always. So God's commandment for us and his commission for us is to arise, to go, and to behold. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. You're tracking? You're with me? All right. So go. And then back to 1 Kings 17. And he arose. So he got the commandment and he responded. So Elijah arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. Wow. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Now, if you're not aware of the Spirit of God being with you, how many of you know this is quite rude? This man just shows up at your house. He doesn't even ask. There's no please. You know, for those of you who are parents here, you know, if my kids said, Bring me a, no, you, you say please or you'll sleep outside. That's, a, that's what, we're, you know, right? Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, it's like she was like, oh, okay. And then, and then this guy, as he's going to get the water. And, and by the way, I need some bread too. How many of you know in her obedience to bring the morsel of bread and the water, it's not. It's not Elijah that he's bringing the stuff, to, uh, she's bringing the stuff to. It's God. And we're going to break that down too. So the second set of three words is bring to me. Bring to me. So I need to drop back a little bit in the story. Elijah, right, is this prophet. And he's well known. For those of you who are familiar with this part of the Bible, if you go, if you rewind back a few chapters, you read about him having this amazing encounter against the, the prophets of Baal. So the, the, the most, um, how would we say, the most prevalent small g god of the time was this, this god called Baal, shaped like a bull. And uh, Baal... Yeah, so it was made in the image of a bull. Isn't that interesting too, right? That the Israelites in the desert trusted in the provision of a bull as well. So now they have this king, and this king's name is Ahab. And Ahab is married to this woman, and her name is, how many of you know her name? What's her name? Jezebel, right? I'm cautious to say that name because, like, in some contexts, it's almost like a swear word, right? Jezebel. 
And the reason why it's like that is because Jezebel had a really bad reputation. Uh, she was manipulative. She was, uh, she basically was the one ruling the nation. But she was a, 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 a worshiper of Baal and instigated and instituted that they would worship this, this god named Baal. And Baal was the god of thunder and lightning. So if you can imagine this bull up on two legs, not four, holding a, a thunderbolt and, and what looked like a storm or lightning, like a cloud. And, and, and this was the image that they would carve out. Oh, Baal, powerful, mighty. And Baal was also the god of fertility. So apart from thunder and lightning, babies. And so, so this, is, this is the power of this, this god. So Elijah had this confrontation with the prophets of Baal. And, I mean, Elijah was the man. Like, he, he, he went there and he said, okay, put your sacrifice on your altar. I'll put my sacrifice on my altar. And they were, like, trying to get the altar lit. And then Elijah goes, I know the God who's really lit. And so God comes down, consumes the sacrifice of Elijah, even though they had water all over it and stuff, to pull it out. And so amazing miracle, right? And so everybody is rejoicing. Let's follow Elijah's God. And they get rid of the prophets of Baal. And so everybody's celebrating Elijah. Extreme high. Extremely famous at the time. Yeah, it was all over Instagram, the photos, right? And so, like, he's super famous at this point. But then what happens is this Jezebel says, hears about this. And she becomes furious at him and says, we need to get this guy. So just one word from this queen, and he went from an extreme high to an extreme low. He runs off to isolate himself. How many of you have been through a situation like that? You come off of an extreme high, you do something amazing, and everyone's like, wow, you're the man, or you're the woman, whatever it is, right? That you're amazing. And then you come off this high, and then somebody, like a little hater, jumps in your comments, goes, yeah, whatever, mate. And then you take it to heart. How many of you know we respond more to bad news than we do good news? And then we start to take it real serious. Like, oh, man, I just feel so sad. Like a Taylor Swift song. I just feel so sad. It's just like a personal attack. And so you go and he's sitting off in some cave and God addresses him. And this is where we meet him. Like after he finally gets over himself, God reminds him, hey, you're not the only prophet here, mate. I've got a few hundred other prophets that are here. You're not the only one. It's like, oh, okay. And then he starts feeding him. And he feeds him through these ravens. Can you imagine? You are sitting there, okay, battling depression, anxiety. And God addresses you and says, hey, you're not the only one. There are others here. So... I'm going to invite you, like, first of all, turn down the noise. I've invited you to the space to turn down the noise so that you can see that you have been defined by your popularity. But now that you are isolated, you can see that your soul is screaming for attention from the wrong source. You need to draw your attention from me, and I have your attention now. And now I'm going to provide for you. I have these uh, Deliveroo ravens that are going to come in and they're going to bring you food. Now, I don't know about you, but if you know anything about the aviary uh, part of the animal kingdom, you will know that the ravens are not necessarily the birds that have the cleanest beaks. They are the, uh, the, the equivalent of the ibis here except they can fly much higher. I remember the first week I moved here, man, and I went to South Bank, right? Just enjoy, just trying to enjoy my fish and chips with my kids. And these ibis just came and said, oh, Uncle Nelly's here. Let's just share his fish and chips. And before you knew it, it was half fish and chips. And you know, I'm still, still scarred by the, by the ibis. This is the, this is the uh, I'm just kidding. This is, this is the, uh, the, the, the posture of these ravens. They come in and they're scavengers. They are takers. Now, this may not be significant to you, but if you study this about this na the nature of these birds, for God to flip the psyche of a 
bird that takes and snatches to be the bird who gives and sustains is a sign from the Lord, right? It's also a sign of the gospel that needs to be at work within us because naturally given to our own inclination, we are takers and snatchers. But when the gospel works itself out in us from a God who gave the best from heaven for us, it transforms us like the ravens into birds that give. I don't know about you. I'll be like, oh, thank you, God. But then there's a little coming in and, and you're like, Here, here's your sandwich. And like, uh, where, where's your big bin? <laughs> like, Ew, yeah, right, bird flu. <laughs> only God can change the nature of a raven. And only God can change the nature of you. He says, okay, the ravens are, they're flying south for the winter, so I'm going to provide for you another way. Go down to Zarephath, and I want you to meet this widow. This widow, again, right, is in Zarephath. Zarephath is a re in the region of Sidon, and Sidon is ruled by Jezebel. And what's the, what's the little God's name again? Baal. It's not God. It's not our God, Yahweh, right? Jehovah. It's not our God. And he goes to this woman. Can you imagine the trust that Elijah had to have in God? God, you better show up. Otherwise, this woman's going to get a shotgun out. You know, I may be a widow. I may have lost my husband, but I'm about to make you lose your life too, right? So he shows up at her house. And this is where I, I just really need to speak to this, this portion of the scripture and address this. Because if we are walking in the spirit, just myself as a Christian leader, as the pastor of this church, there has been situations within the body of Christ where men and women of God have unfortunately throughout church history have used their position of power to be abusive towards those who are in dire situations. I mean, for crying out loud, this widow has, is collecting sticks. And if he in this position comes in and is all like, bring me some water. And some bread. She's like, I'm collecting sticks, man. To, to, like, I can't even afford a lighter. I, I, I'm getting sticks. And you want this from me? It's not, it's not that he's using this position to abuse her. But it's, he, he sees past this instant as an opportunity to bring blessing to her house. And the reason why I wanted to kind of lean into this point is because I know some of us in this room may have been hurt by churches and Christian leaders in the past. And I don't dodge that as your pastor. In fact, I really believe that God's house, this church, not just our church, but the body of Christ should be a place of healing, not a place of abuse. And me as your pastor and the leadership of this church, we want this to be a safe place where you can experience God's healing and relationship. And on behalf of the clergy across the world, where no matter what denomination you've come from, I apologize that you have been treated that way. And I pray that God will give you the grace to trust again. But you don't trust in me, but you learn to trust in God and that God would bring leaders like myself. I, I, it forces me into a position of humility to have to say, you know what, I want to use any power, and all of us should use the power and the authority that God gives you, whether you're a parent here, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a boss at work, you manage people, to use that position and power to serve others, not to overlord it from them. But the reason why I like that, the reason why I had to preface all of, of what I've said to get to this point is that you need to see Elijah's posture. If he had just come off the, the, the back of the, the, uh, the news reports and the Instagram flashes or the real stories, right, of, of him just being on the mountaintop with Baal, then, of course, you know, he'd be like the man, right? And then he would have just been, hey, widow, cook me some eggs, Beth, right? Like, he would have been like that. But you know what? 
He didn't say that. He had to go through a period of humbling and understanding what it is to be isolated. So Elijah saw past what he was asking her to do and saw at the, on the back end of this, I'm telling you, you will never run out if you just obey. And this becomes evident. I just wanted to give you this quote from a wonderful book, a church called Tove by Scott McKnight. He says, yes, the church is part of the good news of Jesus, and the church proclaims the good news of Jesus. But when men and women have only seen the churches formed by unhealthy power, celebrity, competitiveness, secrecy, and self-protection, our corporate ecclesial life belies the truth of the gospel. The church can only witness to the truth of Jesus by seeking justice, serving with humility, operating transparently, and confessing and lamenting failures. See, Elijah was a fallible man, and he was trusting God at the same time too. God, you better be right with this. Because the same God that is speaking to me, you better have gone before me and spoken to her. Because she has every right to say no. She has every right to gather those sticks and beat me over the head with one of those sticks, right? <laughs> Get out of here. And we see it in her response. And she said, there's a little word in here. If you miss it, you might miss what God's doing. As the Lord, your God. It's not her God right now. Notice God transformed the thinking of a raven to be a taker to a giver. She's a worshiper of Baal at this point. As the Lord, so I acknowledge there's something in this God. He's a Lord, He's a ruler, He's the one who reigns, but He's your God. As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. I hope the bread is not the source of the dying. But I want you to see this. The Lord, that you're talking about your God, okay? He's preparing something in me, like he's spoken to me. I, I'm, I'm kind of seeing and that he lives. So she, she didn't have to say that. The Lord, your God, is alive. I hope you caught that. Like, he's living, he's breathing. The Lord your God lives, but I worship this dude named Baal. And so therefore, you know what Baal's done for me? I'm gathering some sticks. We're going to make some bread and we're going to die. That's the fruit of following my God. But there's something special about your God. He lives, but he's your God. My God, sticks, bread, death. Your God, he lives. You're with me. So there's something special here. God's doing something in her heart. Okay. I'm gathering a couple of sticks. See, if we trust in ourselves, the, the, the third set of three words are the title of the song that I sang last week. I should get Natalia to sing. I won't put her on the spot. It's I Have Nothing, right? I should give her the mic now. No, thank you. She said, <laughs> she's saying I will have nothing in my mouth in terms of teeth. That's right. You don't have anything. Nothing is yours. We're called to steward everything we have, the relationships that we have, the resources and the finances that you have. They're not yours. Yesterday, I mean yesterday, last week, I used the example, right, of the, the, the fact that you can't bring any of it with you and, and that, that it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person or a person which mu with much wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't take it with you. The gap is too small. You literally can't take it with you. But we somehow think that, you know, because we were born and everything that we've uh, accrued in this life belongs to us. And God says, no, like, that's all my blessings on your life. You're called to steward them. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. 
But first, just make me a little cake of it, okay? Just a little bit. And bring it to me, and afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, this is what he says, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. This is the invitation. It's still a choice. It's still a choice to obey. You can have your sticks, your bread, and your death, or you can trust me. But in order to trust me, you're going to have to put me first. You choose. Maybe it's not sticks and a jar of oil and flour for you. Maybe it's your investment profile, your career, and die. Or do you trust him by putting him first and then seeing God's amazing, miraculous provision come for you? Blessed to the point where your cup overflows, Psalm 23 says. Your cup runneth, King James. I love the King James. Your cup, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The Hebrew of that last verse, verse 6 of Psalm 23, it's like tackling, like an all black to a wallaby, right? Tackling. Surely goodness and mercy shall tackle me, overrun me. And this is what God wants to do in your life. I'm not just talking about getting money and getting rich so you can buy a Lamborghini and put a fish sticker on it so that you can show people that you believe in Jesus. If you've got a Lamborghini, please don't put bumper stickers on it, right? <laughs> but what, what, what he's saying here is like, I want to bless you. I want to give you more than enough, more than enough resources, more than enough People and friends, remember those? Having friends, not Facebook ones or not Instagram followers. I'm talking about actual friends, like flesh and blood friends. I want to resource you. I want to bring a team around you. I want to finance you. I want to take your little dream that you have and blow it out of your mind to, to greater proportions because my word promises that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything you could ever ask or think. He is greater than your wildest dreams and your imagination, but he wants you to put him first we all clap at that part Woo! yes lord bring it hallelujah i'll sing about it we worship you oh but put him first oh no this is why the word lord comes up so many times in just that one verse thus says the lord the god of israel trust in the lord trust in him don't fear see fear does not come from god Paul exhorts his spiritual son, Timothy, when he is put in charge of the church at Ephesus, which is one of the most influential cities at the time. He says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, son, but he's given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I need you to understand that fear does not come from God. Some of us may have come in this room and you've been fearful. You're fearful of where this is taking us. You see the condition of the world. You see the politics. You see, you know, like the the econo economic situation and turmoil that we're in. You see the real estate market. You're freaking out. You don't know what's happening in the NBA trade deadline right now. I'm believing Damian Lillard's coming to the heat. You don't know what's happening, right? What is happening? But when that fear grips your heart and you're like, God, I'm 22. When am I going to get married? Or well, you're 42 and say, God, I'm married. When am I not going to be married? Like, God, God just, <laughs> your fear does not come from God. God has not given you a spirit of fear. If you walked in here fearful, I'm here to tell you that God wants to invade that fear with his presence so you can behold him and see that he is a good God, but he wants you to put him first. We like the blessings. We want his destiny. But he says, I need to come first. Either I'm Lord of all or not at all. See, this is not a message necessarily about generosity. Surprise, spoiler alert. It's a message about lordship. And he is Lord. And that's why I'm standing here as your pastor. Not wanting to, because I understand the sensitivity around when we start talking about finances. And I've said this over the last four weeks. 
It's a sensitive topic for Australians, right? In a very individualistic society that we live in. And I'm sure you've noticed it. That wherever you came from, especially if you came from a more communal, collectivist society, and then you come to Australia, the, the, the sense of community, it's harder to build it here. Because everybody just wants to build their nice picket fence and their nice real estate profile and just me and mine. And don't, don't talk to me about the kingdom unless it's convenient for me. And then I'll conveniently give whatever loose change I have. And God says, no, I want to be first. If you trust me to be first, it's not in an abusive sense. It's that I want to bless you. I want to give you all that you need. You will trust me as your shepherd and you shall not be in want. That's his promise. Verse 2 of Psalm 23 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Let me say that again. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Meaning that there's like a, sometimes we have a tendency to not want to lie down in the green pastures. There's a position of rest when you trust in him. But if we are fearful, we're always standing up. Bah, 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 bah. He's like, no, I'm making you lie down. S-A-D-D-O-W-N, sat down. Sat down, lie down. Look, all that you need is right in front of you. This green patch of grass, like just eat what's there. What about the next bad field over there? No, no, just focus on here right now. I've given you more than enough right now. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, what did he say? Pray about what I'm going to provide for you next year. No, he says, give us this day our daily bread, not our annual bread. Right? He's got enough for you right now, more than enough for you right now. The fact that you got here to church right now is that, is that we, we are blessed. So the, 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 the fourth set of three words is obviously do not fear. The phrase do not fear appears in the Bible 365 times. I think that's interesting. You got one for every day. Because the moment you wake up, oh no, fear, fear, fear. Do not fear. And most of the times that you read the phrase do not fear, in both the Old and New Testament, it's, it's, always, it's, it's usually with the caveat, do not fear for what? For I am with you. Behold him. Be reminded of his presence. That's what sustains you. But, 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 get your butt out of the way. Do not fear. For I am with you. Do not fear. Turn to somebody and tell them, don't fear. He got you, man. I know that's bad grammar, but just tell me. He got you, man. Okay, we're winding this up. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for how many days? Many days. The jar of flour was not spent, so it never ran out. Neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. It's not Elijah's word. It was the Lord's word. See, I'm just, a, I'm just a mouthpiece for you this morning. Hopefully you can see beyond me and hear the voice of the Lord. He wants to tell you, if you do not fear and you just trust in me, which is basically the last three words, trust in God. If you do not fear and recognize that that fear does not come from me, and you choose to trust in me, I've got you. I will never leave the righteous forsaken, nor have them begging for bread. That's what the Psalms promise you. You will never be in lack. He has you in the palm of his hand. And I'm not just talking about financially. I'm talking about relationally. I'm talking about mentally. I'm talking about spiritually, physically. Greatest remedy for a cold is the presence of God. The Bible says he, sh he shelters us, right, under the shadow of his wings. Like a hen brooding over her chicks is the presence of the Lord. So it's a simple question to sum this message up. Do you trust God in everything? Do we trust him in everything? Oh, I trust you in every area of my life. When it comes to my relationships, don't touch it. I trust you, Lord. I trust you with everything. Oh, but when it comes to my, 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 
finances. I'm like MC Hammer, can't touch this. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. So here are the, the five sets of three words. Arise, go, and behold. Bring it to me, says the Lord. I have nothing. Yeah, you don't. I have everything, says the Lord. Don't fear. Trust in God. And maybe God is speaking to you in whatever season of faith you're in, on your own journey with God. Maybe you've come in here and you may not have thought, well, I don't, I'm not even in that journey with God. I'm here to tell you today, the fact that you're in here, God is speaking one of these things to you. Maybe it's just to trust Him at first. Maybe it's that you've come in here fearful and God would say, do not fear. Maybe you've come in here saying, man, I have nothing. God would say, I'm the source and the creator of all things. And I'm working all things together for the good of those who love you and called according to your purpose. Maybe he's saying, okay, you want to trust me? Bring it to me. Put me first. Bring it to me. Or maybe you've been staying in a comfort zone and God is saying, I want you to rise. I want you to go. And I want you to stay beholding me. Will you trust him today? I want to leave these uh, five phrases up on the screen. And I'm just going to invite us just to take a moment to pray this morning and ask God to speak to us with regards to where we are in our journey of faith. Let me just give you about 20 seconds right now just to uh, be silent before Him. And I'm going to trust that God is going to speak to you and then I will pray for you and we're going to take some time to respond. Here's your 20 seconds. further 10 seconds just to respond to what he might be speaking to you right now. Maybe he's calling you to step out. Maybe he's calling you to respond in a specific way. Whether you want to take a note of what he's telling you to do or you want to respond and just commit to doing that thing or however you want to respond right now. I'll just give you 10 seconds personally just to respond to him as he speaks to you today by his spirit. Father, thank you this morning that your desire is to, to envelop your children in your arms. Father, I thank you that in trusting in your presence, Lord, there is healing where trust has been abused. There is restoration of trust. There is a restoration of faith, Lord God, is an igniting of grace within our, uh, our lives, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, that however you are speaking to us in whatever season we're in, Father, I thank you that your desire is to provide, protect, and to fill the hearts and lives of your children here today. So God, I thank you that your call is to arise, go, and continue to behold you in all that we do. I thank you, Lord, that even as we've come here, we, we come more than with more than just attendance and songs. Lord. We come to bring ourselves and to put you first. We thank you, Lord, that in our nothingness, you are our everything. Lord, we pray the prayer of John the Baptist, Lord, that we would decrease, that you may increase in our lives. Lord, we abandon fear right now. Father, right now, I just pray that there would be just a rebuking and a, and a complaint.
complete elimination of the spirit of fear in this place right now. For you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I thank you for faith being ignited in this room today. And I thank you, Lord, that you are a trustworthy God, that we can trust you wholeheartedly, that you are Lord of the breakthrough, that you are Lord of the harvest, that you would come and have your way in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for who he is this morning? Thank you. So thankful that you can join us here today at Every Nation Brisbane. We hope and pray that you were impacted deeply by God's challenge in the message or in the worship. Please do let us know how we can pray for you, uh, either in the chat or you can message us or email us at info at enbrisbane.org. Again, if you want to learn more about who we are as a church, you can also uh, interact with us on our website, uh, which is enbrisbane.org, and you'll learn more about who we are. Obviously, we're on all the socials. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. We're on all of that, and you can interact with us there or hear more uh, all about uh, what we're doing as a church. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know how we can serve you. Let us know how we can pray for you and stand with you in everything that God is doing in and through your life, no matter where you're from. We're just really blessed that you could be here. Thank you for all of you who continue to sow faithfully into our church here. If you want to learn more about how you might be able to sow, you can go onto our website at enbrisbane.org slash give, and you'll see all the information there with regards to how you might sow. We just thank you so much for continuing to sow into all that God is doing in this church and through this church into the kingdom of God here in Brisbane. And so we're really thankful that you are here with us today. And we pray that you would have a blessed week ahead. Let us know how we can stand with you. Stay in contact. And let's continue to walk in everything that God has for us as we honor God and we love people. Grace and peace.